Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part two of our discussion about freedom from politics with special guest Stephanie Murphy. So thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the discussion. One of the things I wanted to talk about, Jake, today with you was um, some of the things that minarchists or people who participate in politics will say to almost like it almost sounds like they're trying to justify it like to themselves you know oh yeah yeah what, what comes to mind for you when you when you when you think of that well a lot of them say it's self defense and not only is that putting the whole system in a violent context in the first place which it is it is violence and they can admit that but they're like no 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 participating in politics is is self defense but if you think about that do you really want to be living your life in the framework of thinking that I am constantly under attack and I'm needing to defend myself. And by the way, the attacker, it's their full-time job and they get paid for it and they have all the time in the world to think up different schemes to aggress against me with. But for me, I have a job and a family and all this other stuff that I need to do and I need to somehow make time to defend myself. You know, it's like you're coming from a very disadvantaged position in that whole arrangement. So do you really want to spend so much time like energy thinking of yourself as constantly being under attack, you know, and yeah. I think that really contributes to a dearth of personal freedom when you're, you're always thinking of, of that, like everyone's out to get me, they're attacking me. I need to take my liberties by force or whatever. Yeah. And that sounds to me like, you know, a classic example of what we were talking about earlier of the, just the more that you uh, are involved in worrying and thinking and, and looking at these things, oh, I've got to vote against this bill because that's going to do X and I've got to get um, this candidate in because he's slightly more freedom-oriented and so forth. It, it, you can't spend that time on the things that you can really impact, um, mm. which are the people in your life, you know, which are not your personal relationships. And yourself. And yourself, yeah. absolutely, and yourself. And, you know, it's like I, I saw... Um, I mean, we, we see statist arguments all the time and people will say things like um, the government needs to do X, Y, and Z to promote jobs and create jobs, right? No, and, yeah, and, yeah. and everyone from a liberty perspective, like people can take that part immediately in terms of the sort of economic fallacies and all of that. But the thought that occurs to me is like, I saw that comment by, posted by somebody on Facebook recently and, and it was an academic and I was thinking like, what jobs have you ever created? You know, you, 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 <laughs> what experience have you got with creating a single job? And and the way that you want to think about job creation, if that's your thing, right? If you were really interested in creating jobs, then you know, why don't you go and make some? You know, go and found a company and make some jobs. That's mm -hmm. job creation in your in your own control, right? You can actually go out there if you think that's so important. You can do something about it. And you know, it's it's like. It, the the excuses that that people give for involvement in just even mental energy finances resources to do with mm. the state I, the way i look at it is that one day um you know it's it might it's not necessarily it's not 100 percent sure this is going to happen but one day humanity surely will have outgrown the state right we won't you know we will get to a point where we're so enlightened that this is just ridiculous stupid disgusting system will be gone forever mm. and so like in the meantime you know the the more that you can do to effectively have like a revolution in your own life in, mm. in the way that you behave towards other people and yourself like so that you, if you're involved in, in entrepreneurship and generating value for others in a voluntary way and if you have peaceful relationships and raise your children peacefully and, you know, and, and then that's – it's that thing that, I mean, I really think is true that you have to actually be the change that, that you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that you should focus in a self-defense way on, you know, voting for X and voting for Y – for me, I can't get over the fact that that just gives a sense of legitimacy to the whole stupid game in the first place. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. It's yeah. Like, you know, it, it, why not just not play, you know, just go, go and do something <laughs> more productive. 
Yeah, um, I don't agree to abide by these rules. Yeah, and of course we have to, you know, we have to survive in this status world, and that means I, I don't want to go to prison. So yeah, I'm going to pay my taxes and stuff because I actually mm-hmm. want to do as much. Uh, I want to enjoy my life as much as I can and experience as much freedom as I can. Um, and so yeah, I will absolutely, uh, you know, use public roads and pay pay the taxes, um, mm-hmm. but because I I want to stay free. But the one thing I don't have to do is to lend any moral legitimacy to the system by either voting or supporting candidates or, or you know, getting involved in the whole political process. I think, you know, when we treat the, the state as something that is not worthy of any time, attention, respect, and, you know, we do things only because we actually have to, but we just don't, just don't pay it any more, a second more attention than we have to, then at least we can live, you know, as much of our own personal life in that future world where it's no longer, you know, where people are so enlightened that they no longer need it anymore, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Yeah, it, I, I don't think people realize until they step outside of the paradigm of statism how much of a drag it can be on you, you know, on yourself. Like, I think a lot of people do realize that, like, are familiar with the concept of opportunity costs. As as libertarians, a lot of people are interested in economics, right? And so they learn some of these terms, like opportunity cost, which means if you're doing something, then you're not doing something else. And what is the thing that you're not able to do because you're doing what you're doing? Yeah. And could that thing that you're not doing be helping you more than what you are doing, right? Um, and I think in the case of politics, like the time and mental energy that people expend on it, absolutely, there are definitely other things you could be doing that could help you more, you know, to become, to become a happier person, to become a freer person. Um, and I, I think people may underestimate the, the value of, of just ign- kind of ignoring the state as yeah. much as possible and living free despite what they say. And I mean, this is, you know, obviously, I, as I say, I, I've been so involved that I was actually out on street corner selling newspapers when I was 17. Mm. And I like just in terms of the opportunity cost, you know, I could have been learning about entrepreneurship at that point. I could have I could have tried mm. as a 17 year old. I could have tried starting a business, you know, and yeah. I could have had a spectacular failure in, in business for a year and a half that I had spent in in doing politics. And that would have been an amazing an amazing thing to do and you know i could have had a spectacular success and that would have been an amazing thing to do too but either way it would have provided real value to me and potentially real value to others as well and would have actually done something positive and constructive to change the world my world in my personal life and the objective world out there um, because it would have been you know providing something voluntarily um, that is of value to other people and that like that's it's what's sad to me is that so much, um, so much constructive uh, stuff is lost in that opportunity cost that you're talking about. You know, if mm-hmm. all of that mental energy and passion that people put into um, into the game of politics, if they put that into doing something constructive um, with their own life, how much more freedom could they have, and what benefit would that have? You know, as a as a as a part of a uh, a positive impact to, um, on, on all those people that, that surround them. And it can actually, it's something that you can actually do because it's, it's in your control and the state is just never going to be in your control. Oh, yeah. And, and not only that, but, um, you know, the state, when you, when you get involved in the political game, it's always a gamble. Uh, I would say it's, it's guaranteed also to be a compromise in values, and things that you want to get because you're never going to get all the freedom that you really want, right? Um, you're going to get maybe scraps of freedom if you're successful, which is unlikely. Um, so the political ga- the political game is, is a game, right? It's like a wager and you're not guaranteed to get what you want. But if you invest that time, energy, money, uh, sweat, equity, I guess, into yourself, uh, you are guaranteed to get more freedom, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like you, you can't fit, like you said, if you, if you had started a business or learned about entrepreneurship or, you know, done some introspection and, and started getting more, you know, trying to get self knowledge and worked on your personal happiness, uh, maybe built up relationships with other people that were fulfilling, you know, you're going to get something awesome out of that. 
yeah. no matter which which one of those you choose. So absolutely, I, that that's another thing. That that's another thing that you know. Just taking my example again, as you say, the introspection. What if I'd chosen that for that year and a half to really work on all my friendships, on all my relationships, to really focus like on what do I want out of this relationship? What can I give? How can this be the best friendship ever? You know, what can what what's going on in my family? Well, lots of stuff that actually, you know, I trundled along for years without really evaluating those things. But mm. what kind of positive impact could I have had? Uh, you know, on my life, if I had really chosen to do that. And through that, you know, also positive impact by, you know, by actually living my values, you know, in terms of of, uh, of, of um, how I want to, to be treated and how I want to treat others and so forth. Yeah, uh, that's an, another really uh, key point here, I think, is that there is sort of a cost in terms of personal integrity, you know, like I, I don't want to say, I really hate taking the tact that, uh, voting is immoral. And if you engage in it, then you're just dirtying your soul. And, you know, <laughs> that's obviously not true. Um, I am willing to say that it's, it's, it's unjust and it probably isn't benefiting people who participate in it. Yeah. Just to, to follow on what you were saying, what, what occurs to me is that the issue is one of, of, of potential hypocrisy, right? Because yes. I, for me, it's like, you know, you hear status talking about poverty. They're very concerned about poverty. And then often you think like, well, you know, what have you done like yourself? Like if you're so <laughs> interested in what wealth have you generated? If you if poverty is a problem that you see in the world, what have you done to generate more wealth in the world? You know, and and for me, it's the same with politics. It's like whatever issue you choose, you know, whether or not you're interested in, I don't know, the environment or um personal liberty or anything right there's always going to be something that you can actually personally do to affect a change in in the world around you that if you choose to invest your time and energy in politics then you have this long causal chain which is like well i'm going to go out and i'm going to do activism for this mm -hmm. candidate and then the candidate is going to become a nominee and then he's going to get the you know then he, the people other people are going to vote for him and then he's going to get into office and then he's going to have you know make good on all of these promises and so and then finally that thing that i want to see happen that's going to get done you know it's like <laughs> this massive causal chain when actually you know whatever it is that you are concerned about at least for me like i really have a lot of respect for people who go out and do something about it right i mean at least then for me that's like well you know this person obviously really takes this seriously because they have devoted their own time to what they consider to be something that they think needs addressing in their life and their relationships or in the world around them their town in their in you know in their part of the world so like that that to me is the the thing is that like it, it's kind of if you know if you're involved in politics and and this again i guess this comes from my family um, experience right but you know i i guess maybe one of the reasons that i got to sort of see outside the box of of politics was because there's a lot of rhetoric in communism um and in communist ideology about injustice and mm. uh you know and about people needing fairer treatment and so forth and I saw what the personal relationships were like of the people who were involved in politics. And it's like, you know, really, if you're interested in people treating each other better and issues like justice, uh, how can you how can you have these kind of relationships? You know, <laughs> and that that was me viewing. I, I didn't really think of it that consciously because I was a kid at the time, but mm -hmm. I definitely like I know that I picked up. You know, oh, we're all about the the better treatment of people and the justice thing. And then I saw the environment that, you know, the, the, the childhood that I had, the environment I was brought up in, and even the adult relationships and how they treated each other. And it's like, wow, mm. there's a real disconnect there. And at least if you do things in your own life, you know, at least you demonstrate by example what it is that you, you think you, know, you, you value most because um, you can actually do it in your life as opposed to saying, oh, I'm all about this issue. I'm all about that issue. But really, I want somebody else um, to go and, and do it for me. Um, it reminds me of that quote by, I think it's Penn Gillette, um, that I was going around the internet recently that he was saying, you know, there's absolutely nothing moral about being all concerned about poverty. If your solution is to go and force somebody else to give up their money 
um, involuntarily through taxes so that you can get somebody else to do something for you. You know, if, you, if there's nothing moral about that, it's totally immoral. What is moral is if you think that's an important issue, then you go and do something about it yourself. And I, I, like, I really, that, that argument, uh, I, I find to be a completely convincing one. Yeah, I, I do too. And I, I think what I was going to say before about, um, integrity is that I, I always hesitate to, I think I, I kind of bristle a little bit at saying things like politics is immoral or participating in the system is, is just a moral, wretched, you know, horror because, I think that there are probably people who hear that, and I was probably one of them at one time, who who hear that and then shut off. You know, they're like, "Oh, well, this person's saying I'm immoral. What can I do?" You know. Um, but for me, when I was participating in politics, I always afterwards ended up feeling just like kind of devastated, like I was taking a personal psychological hit. You know what I mean? And oh, I it. it it was almost, I always felt like just sh- dirty, you know, just, it's hard to describe the feeling, but just like I had given up something about myself for, in exchange for the possibility of more freedom, which was unlikely to even happen. And it was almost like this self-sacrificial attitude that the objectivist in me now like really bristles at. It's like, you know, hey, I shouldn't have to give something up in order for the possibility of having more freedom. You know, I should... Absolutely. Whatever I invest in myself and my own personal freedom, I should get a return on, you know? And yeah. the way to do that is is through alternatives to politics. Yeah, absolutely. And the idea, I think, that, that trips people up, I guess this is another one, uh, this is a similar to, similar idea to the, the sort of the Harry Brown, like, fallacies, the traps that he talks about. But the the, the thing that occurs to me is... When people get um, caught up in politics, is it's this idea that um, that society is like this thing out there, right? It's an object out there, society, right? And you know, you can study it and examine its like political laws and and uh, um, and kind of find its regularities and stuff, and that your personal life is irrelevant to all of that. Like, you know, to be a good political economist, you're studying the objective society out there. Your personal life, that would mm. just be, you know, talking about yourself, that would be like an, a, a logical fallacy because we're talking about the society <laughs> out there, right? My, 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 what I do with my own time, that, oh, no, that doesn't matter. But, but it's, and you can see how that actually, what that does is it kind of detaches yourself from looking at, your life because like mm-hmm. society is only a concept that, that we have to describe relationships between individuals and i'm an individual i have relationships so if i want to change society then like i'm actually really this is where it starts it starts with my little bit of society which is right here you know and and that's mm-hmm. where in terms of what you were talking about your return on investment you know that's where you can actually make the impact is, is, is right there. And I, I do understand that, you know, the, the whole debate about, well, is it moral or immoral to get involved in voting and, and all of that kind of stuff? People can get totally switched off by that. And I would say, well, just think of it this way, that if you're interested in affecting change, then you actually have like a little part of society right in your control, which is starting with your relationships. And that's where, as you say, that's where you can get uh maximum impact and and you can have maximum value both to yourself and the people you impact and you're going to get all the feedback too because people will tell you whether or not the things that you're doing um work for them and and so forth whereas if you get involved in some political campaign you're you're ceding your control to some very distant group of people who may or may not you know ever um uh uh, do anything that you think that they say that they're going to do you know yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Jake, when you just mentioned the disconnect, the aspect of disconnection from oneself that people can feel when they participate in politics, as if, well, what I do in my personal life doesn't matter, but the political, that'll really affect the world, right? Mm. I immediately thought of the idea that politicians, especially like the big politicians, and especially here in, in the US, I don't know what it's like, I'm not too familiar with politics in other parts of the world, but it's just, it's a stereotype, it's a meme and it with good reason that politicians are notorious for um you know 
marital infidelity and sexual harassment and uh, default, you know, having bad personal credit and like just just not really following these basic standards uh, of behavior that are you know, supposed to be necessary for a functioning society, you know, even all these things that they want to outlaw and ban, you know, not that I would say that it's, um, not, I don't think it should be a, a criminalized, you know, to use drugs, but a lot of them have used drugs, but yet are like the ones that are, oh, we need to toughen up the war on drugs and put more people in jail. Well, yeah, do they, yeah. and, and they should have been put in jail? No. <laughs> yeah. And there's the cliche about the ones who are, you know, trying to constrain the rights of gay people in various ways and then they get it's discovered that they've actually they've been a homosexual all their life and they've been in the closet and so yeah. it's like it's a com- the complete personal hypocrisy of it is is uh, comes out again and again yeah yeah i and i wonder a lot if it's more than just hypocrisy and if they're not even conscious of it but they are trying to literally like repeat out the abuse in the case of closet you know closet gays that they are literally trying to like repeat the abuse that has been done to them their whole lives onto everybody through the political system, you know? Yeah, that, that sounds very plausible. Yeah. Mm. Which is pretty sad and, uh, and awful, awful thing to do, but, uh, Oh, yeah, tragic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I guess just, I wanted to just mention another idea that came to mind when you, can you were saying like people basically thinking about how can we, uh, what, what can we give people to think about this if they are involved in politics? And the other, the other thing that comes to mind for me is, is a great um, clip. I'm sure you've seen it, actually, because it's been around the Internet so many times, but about voting and involvement in politics by George Carlin. And he made a point, which I think is, is, um, is just really good, which is that people say to him often, um, you know, well, if you don't vote, you know, you've got no right to complain. <laughs> and he makes the point like well actually i'm the person who who i'm the one who really does have the right to complain because i'm not voting <laughs> I'm, there's nothing to do with me right you people who are out there voting you have no right to complain because you're <laughs> giving your like he doesn't say it in these words but basically the the point he's making is like you're involved you're making you're giving it your your sanction right the whole system you're giving it your sanction like so actually you know it, it, he's making a principled stand which is like i'm showing that this whole system is just ridiculous by not even participating in it and the idea that i don't then get a chance to complain is actually the opposite way around i'm the only one who really does have the right to complain <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's a great point yeah he was he got it i mean he was really spot on with that yeah, it's definitely. it's totally true so um, I've had many an email exchange with uh, <laughs> with people about this with Minerkis, and uh, one of the things that I think they I think they often say is that it, like it's it's almost um, it's almost like they're participating in an ongoing feud, you know? Like there's this violent rhetoric, right? And I I just recall like there was this political campaign back a couple of years ago in the U.S where this politician actually drew like she had a map of the US with like targets on her opponent's faces and oh yeah yeah i seem to remember seeing that online yeah yeah and um by the way if people are listening to this show and uh, and like the topic there was another show that um myself and Brett Vinat from the school sucks podcast and uh George Mandrick participated in and it's on the school sucks podcast feed and it's something about it's it's along the same lines about voting and Ron Paul and freedom from politics it's uh, awesome that discussion is is really really worth listening to i would highly recommend it it's brilliant so yeah definitely um that's a good thing to listen to if you're interested oh thank you yeah um so that that idea of the politician with the targets on people's faces came up during that discussion on the School Sucks podcast. And um, I think there are people who feel the need to like stay involved in politics because they, they think it's like unfinished. Like there's this, there's this battle, this back and forth that they're participating in and it's, it's unfinished and, and getting out of it would be almost like surrendering or giving up. Have you ever heard this? You know, that, yeah, that, that does really, um, I haven't heard that argument made in that way, but I think that that's a great description of what's going on under the surface. It's like, well, I mean, we can't get out now because then, you know, yeah. the, the sort of, you know, 
Mordor will take over, you know, <laughs> you've got to keep on the fights, you know, that's the yeah. sort of sense that, that, um, that <laughs> to, to leave political activism would be in a sense to kind of like leave the world to the bad people. And, uh, you know, and, right. and you'd, be, you'd be kind of then you would just be like sitting there on your ass, basically, whilst um, the, the sort of the, the all the liberties that we have are overrun by these awful politicians and so forth. And, and in a sense, it's like an abdication of your sort of duty in a way that to to, to, to you've got to keep stay in there, stay active and, and keep get, ha, sort of fielding liberty oriented candidates to kind of prevent the world from going under. I think that's what people that's the sense that people have. Yeah, and and you're right, Jake. I have never heard them explicitly say that or express it in that way. But definitely, some of the things that they they say, it's like, well, I, I just just hang on until Ron Paul retires, or you know, just yeah, yeah. till the end of this election campaign. Or it's it's almost like they're just holding on to it um, until what they see is like a armistice or something in this war this ongoing war like you know we have always been at war with uh, yeah, East yeah, Asia. Eurasia, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so um i think like making the war metaphor explicit is a good way to point it out yeah like, like getting it above the surface so you can actually address it as a point yeah and there are just so many things in politics that pr- that when you have your antennas out for them will confirm this or will will uh will bring this to light ever more uh obviously you know uh like actually uh, for some reason i just watched the ron paul highlights of a recent political republican debate mm. and it was literally like the the commentators of the debate or the people who were leading were trying to get the candidates to s- insult each other they were insulting each other they were basically calling each other hypocrites and then trying to defend why they were not hypocrites to the audience. <laughs> and and uh, there was a lot of, like, have you ever noticed in politics there's a lot of these this language? And, you know, it's easy to overanalyze language and so forth, but I think it's, I think it has value. Like there's, there's this metaphor, like the battle, the war, the battlefield of the yeah, campaign. Yeah. And there's there's different fronts that people fight on, and and oh yeah, when you donate to Ron Paul, it's a money bomb. Mm. Really, it's a money bomb. <laughs> like the, it's so ironic that he's everybody says he's the only candidate that's talking about peace in the Middle East, which may be true, but yet when his supporters are donating to him, it's called a money bomb. And yeah. he didn't think of that, you know, somebody else did. But it's it's kind of funny that that came out of their subconscious as like what they were going to call a mass donation, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it strikes me that this, there is something going on there, which is that they, on, on an unconscious level, that it is, they're, they're, they realize that they're locked into a, a game of, of, of force and coercion because that's what politics is all about, right? Mm. Who, who gets to hold the reins of power. And I mean, I think that really the argument against that, there, there's, there's two arguments against that. One is they, um, a practical argument which is like and again that reminds me of harry brown because in that book in how i found freedom in an unfree world he talks about um the the government trap which is the fallacy that government is like an instrument to effectively do things you know it's like this is like a tool that you can use to do things when it's just not it's a gang of people who take money by force and you know there's mm. there's no absolutely no way to um think of this gang which is essentially like the mafia or something as like an instrument or tool of of trying to achieve certain ends it's like right. trying to push a piece of string it's, it's it doesn't go where you want it to go it does it does it has its own dynamic which is about what the people who are in control what deals they've made and who they are allied to so to speak and and so there's a, a practical side which is like thinking that you can get the government to do anything for a start is a fallacy because no mm. government program ever ends up achieving what it's supposed to do and so forth and yeah I, I, the, the other side of it is is the the, the principle uh, involved which is that if if it is this battlefield of uh people involved in in trying to get hold of coercion then the idea that i by withdrawing from that I'm sort of like ceding the territory to, you know, yeah. bad people <laughs> is, is like, actually, it's like, you know, 
I would say let's not uh, let's not as a matter of principle get involved in trying to use coercion i mean to yeah. force people to do something right i mean how about because you're going to get sucked into that con- con- coercion eventually right like yeah. if you if you participate in a system that is inherently full of if you step onto the battlefield you're going to get shot or you're going to get maimed right and, you know, and also you're going to get morally compromised because you know you're going to end up trying to to win a dirty fight right and yeah. uh, and I think as a matter of principle, if like what what if what if we got to this is another thing that I I think a lot of people uh, um, would would say that people are interested in freedom is like okay look imagine we were at a situation where ninety percent of the world was now so enlightened right that they realized you know we don't need a state we can do all these things voluntarily we can have a great um, uh, productive a peaceful society and yes we can resolve disputes through private arbitration and so on and so forth what if 90 percent of the people understood that really fundamentally mm. understood it would you vote then yeah and i think you know most people involved in liberty would say well no i mean you know if, if like 90 percent of people weren't voting because they were saying you know we've we've grown up now we don't need the state we we do as as Doug Stanhope Dan, as Doug Stanhope says, you know, what if I don't need a leader? Right, I get by okay <laughs> on my own. <laughs> what yeah, if where do I, where's that box to tick? You know, and what <laughs> what, what if what if ninety percent of people had got to the point where they were saying this is just ridiculous? You know, I mean, we don't need a state. Uh, we can we're all so enlightened and we have such clear principles. Would you vote then? And I don't think I think a lot of people involved in in liberty at that point they wouldn't vote, right? They would say, "Yeah, you're right. Let's you know that actually then then we would be just about there in terms of having a truly free society." So I mean, if it's not ninety percent, you know, if you wouldn't vote at ninety, why not just show a bit of leadership and and not vote now? You know? Um, yeah. Like yeah, how definitely. how are we going to get to the ninety percent if there aren't some people who are saying, you know? Like, because it's not really any. I mean, there's no. We we actually live in a, in the, in a society that you cannot. You can you can abstain from voting, and you know it's not like you're going to get put in prison or anything like that. It's unless you live in Australia, right? Don't they have a mandatory voting thing? Is that right? Do they? I I think so. I I'm not sure. That. I didn't know that. There are some places where it is mandatory, but yeah, not in the U.S. and not in most parts of Europe, I don't think. Yeah, and I mean, I would say even if, let's say, they they put a law in tomorrow that said, you know, you're going to be put in prison if you don't vote, I would totally go and and uh, vote. I mean, I might destroy my, like, do a spoiled ballot or whatever if I could. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I would totally go and vote. But the point would be, I would say to all my friends and everyone, this is a stupid, ridiculous uh, thing that I'm being forced to do and mm-hmm. I do not have, I don't give it any of my moral support. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's basically what I'm talking about. It's like, if not, you wouldn't be saying you can get more freedom by right. going to the ballot. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, it, it's, so I think that's the way I would answer that, um, that, uh, that point. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you brought up that particular example about, about like the 90, you know, at the point when 90% of people are opposed to the system on moral grounds and are not wanting to support a political process that is, is like we have today. Mm. Um, I've heard, I've heard people who support voting counter that argument by saying, um, well, you know, even if there are only 10% of people left who support the system and who vote, those 10% of people are going to vote themselves into power and nothing will change. And I disagree with that because I think that if there are not, if, if there is a point where there are 90% of people or even like even 50% of people, even a significant minority, like 30%, let's say, who, and by the way, there already is, like most people in the U.S. do not vote, yeah. <laughs> you know, and could care less about politics, right? But, you know, the, the, the people who are in the system, the more people who reject the system, or do, or ignore the system or don't care about it the people who are in the system become increasingly irrelevant you know and even if they are electing themselves into power if people are ignoring the system uh, that's what really gives them legitimacy if 90% of the people are 
ignoring the system, how could that 10% who is voting themselves in have any legitimacy? Yeah, absolutely, you know? absolutely. Because it depends yeah. on other people confirming their legitimacy, right? Yeah, that, that's the point where we just laugh the politicians out of town, basically. Yeah. That's the point where, you know, well, it's like the collapse of communism, right? They can, they can order things to happen and it just the whole thing just falls apart. Right. But it uh, falls apart in a peaceful way where, you know, peaceful uh, non-cooperation with the with the state becomes a truly, uh, you know, a truly viable thing. You know, mm-hmm. you, you get to the point where it actually it, it does just fall apart. And and that happens in, in, in dictatorships all the time um, that they they lose the moral legitimacy, um, because the only way that anybody gets to stay in power is by having enough people who say, well, yes, it might not be fun, but we need this because otherwise bad things would happen, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I, I'm reminded of the Emma Goldman quote, if voting changed anything, it would be illegal, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. She was like, a, <laughs> I wonder what, what she and uh, George Carlin and Doug Stanhope would have had to say to each other <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> the the non, non-voting uh, dinner party of history. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's another aspect that um, I would like to bring up about this whole concept of like spending your time and energy voting and stuff like that. Um, I didn't mention this before, but during the time in my life where I was actively participating in politics, it wasn't just that. And the reason why I think Jake and I are both saying that politics, you know, participation in the system requires a lot of time and personal energy and blood, sweat and tears, for lack of a better word, is because Around that time where I was doing politics, I was also following the political media and the news very heavily oh, and gosh. trying to find out to educate myself. And it like it was like I could never really know everything that was going on and be an insider in the political system. But I felt I had to keep doing that for some reason. I, I felt this drive to uh, to continue trying to learn about it and the ins and outs and stuff. And of course, I could never keep up. And it was like... All of those mainstream news drivel that I was listening to, I could have been listening to, you know, Complete Liberty podcast or something like that and, you know, learning something that I could use and could actually keep up with, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I I hear a lot of minarchists who will say something like, um, but I enjoy following the political news and I, I like to keep up with this narrative. So that's how I wanted to relate it, uh, to relate my own experience to um, another common objection that I that I guess I hear from minarchists. Oh, I think that's a great one. I mean, I definitely know that, um, like, the 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 sense of I, I don't I just don't bother with um, mainstream news uh, more than maybe once a month. Um, yeah, me neither, and I, I feel like it's. Uh, oh, such resulted a in a lot more. Yeah, oh, <laughs> personal, such a relief. You know. Yeah, yeah, because. <laughs> You know, it's like, uh, it's that thing where you've probably had this. <laughs> I, I used to travel for work and sometimes I'd be um, staying in a hotel or, or whatever. And you turn on the TV and they'd always have CNN or, you know, one of the news channels, right? And typically if I was also if I was in a foreign country, then maybe there wouldn't be that many channels that I could, that I could actually understand. If I just got there, I was exhausted and really tired and just, just wanted to basically, uh, you know, just, chill out and have the tv on in the background because i don't have a tv so i don't really watch tv mm-hmm. so it it's uh, and that's another reason why i don't have a tv actually is because this is just a because uh, it's just well, the the news chatter and everything is just so so pointless but then when mm-hmm. i do watch cnn or something for half an hour i realize like this is just there's just nothing of any depth in here at all this is all like political mm-hmm. gossip you know so and so yes. said this, and so ooh, and so and so said that, and, and it's <laughs> like uh, you, you realize that this is just a big gossip show for people yep. who are involved in in the game of, of politics. And, politics and, is Hollywood for u- ugly people, right? Isn't that what yeah, they say? Exactly. That's what they say, <laughs> that exactly, and um, and so yeah, I I think. That is so liberating not to uh, to to get out there. I actually, it's funny because it doesn't matter what political um, part you come from. The addiction to the news media is totally there. When I was involved as a seventeen-year-old, mm. when I had my brief period of being involved in revolutionary communist politics, I was like reading 
the I mean this I guess is was maybe a step up because I was reading the Financial Times and looking at like markets and trying to understand that because the, mm. because they were very interested in the economics. So I guess that's in a sense slightly more useful, but still there's this addiction with the news cycle and with the you know what people are saying about these issues and those issues when actually you know it's when you take a step back and realize that you know you can actually you can you can look at the news once a month and your life is great you don't nothing happens that you need to really concern yourself with you know the very very big things you're going to hear about it anyway because somebody's going to tell yeah. you um, but actually you, you you get all this time to spend on things that you really value and and so for example you know if you are interested in economics um one thing you can do is you can watch the news media and you can watch all of these um uh you know newsy um economicsy programs talk about government policy the other thing is you can just every now and again you can look at the markets you know you can look at the gold price and you can look at um the stock market and you can f actually look at your get your own sense of what's happening and all of that chatter uh, is just becomes what it is it's just like background chatter you can actually mm. form your own view as to you know what what is going on and that is so liberating and so i guess that would be my response to people who say that they they feel like they're really interested in that it's like well i mean if you get really into lord of the rings you can get really interested in like you know which elf does what and so <laughs> forth like you can get like you can do that too if you want right but that in, in a sense that's what politics is like to me it's like or it's like getting involved in in the, as you say the hollywood gossip who is sleeping with who did this did that couple break up and so forth some people mm -hmm. can really get into that but you know you also kind of know that that's just a waste of time right i mean the, the ultimately yeah. ultimately that you can it's or at least not a waste of time it's a huge time sink put it that way um so mm -hmm. even if you enjoy it it's a huge time sink for very little personal benefit that um yeah that that's my sense on that what do you think yeah, I I completely agree, and I can relate to the experience of giving up that stuff and ha and feeling an enormous, enormously positive, <laughs> you know, liberating force in my life. I guess uh, from from like letting go of that, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think also the the mainstream news and like people who talk about political talk it seems also sort of have this same undercurrent of embarrassing or shaming or laughing at people, ridiculing people who don't fall within that paradigm. And so I right. think listening to that stuff kind of tends to reinforce some of the self-shaming or self-ridicule that occurs sometimes with people uh, when they think, well, you know, I don't, I don't I don't want to embarrass myself by doing some kind of street theater activism on this topic. I better play the political game and wear a suit and, you know, look respectable and so forth, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I it, it just uh, it occurs to me that one way to think about how useless it is 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 like the phrase old news, you know. I mean, whoever goes back and looks at old news and mm. thinks, "Wow, that's yeah, it, it can sometimes be kind of interesting as a sort of like his curiosity like wow this is what they were talking about in the 50s or something you know what i mean but it's it's just junk and none of it matters beyond the short news cycle that that, that, that it actually approaches so yeah 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 <laughs> that is that is completely true yeah uh so jake i know we're coming up on uh, a couple hours and maybe we should end out the show yeah i think we <laughs> this should is a yeah great discussion i mean i'd love to i'd love to continue especially on some of these other topics that we discussed you know maybe later on yeah like no like i really really appreciate you taking the time and um yeah it, it was great fun for me and uh, i want to make sure also that um we just point people to your um your podcast again um so sure. can you can you give the urls of your podcasts 
Yeah, um, I, I'll just I'll just direct people to Pork Therapy, which is my radio show and podcast. It's heard on LRN.FM with The Voluntary Life, which is in, in the podcast loop. And LRN is the Liberty Radio Network. And if you want to hear all of my old shows and find out more about Pork Therapy, it's PORCtherapy.com. That's pork, like a porcupine, of course, and uh, for those who don't get the reference, maybe the first time hearing about it, the porcupine is the mascot of the Free State Project, which we talked about earlier on this program. Yeah. So uh, that's where the name comes from. And I'm not a therapist. I'm just uh, an amateur who likes to talk about uh, psychology and relationships and personal freedom. And that's why I think it's so great that Jake and I met each other and teamed up and you know did the show together because our interests are really uh, very similar uh, on our shows and they dovetail really well. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to, you know, we're going to look at doing some similar, um, uh, well, related issues about getting more freedom in your life too. Uh, in the future, we're going to get some, potentially some, um, some, uh, group, group discussions going, um, mm -hmm. together with Stephanie and I. So, uh, yeah, look out for that in the future. Look out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephanie. Great talking Thank to you. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, th you. this was great. Thank you so much.